Okay, third, third time. Good afternoon, everyone, and warm welcome to this second webinar of the East Nordic chapter. Um, when we discussed among a few uh, of the Nordic people, members of East, about topics that could be of potential interest, um, we agreed that sensitive and inclusive language is definitely something that would concern everyone, no matter in what field as an editor you work in. Um, so this is uh, the topic that we choose, and we're very glad to have Emilia Harding with us today, because Emilia, who is a, an editor at the BMJ, has a long-standing experience in the publishing field, I think 10 years it was after you had your, uh, your, your PhD in biology, and uh, she also was instrumental in setting up some uh, policies at the BMJ where she works uh, to use internal guide internally guidelines on sensitive and inclusive language use and she will share her experiences and her knowledge with us today we uh, have a question and answer session after um, Emilia's presentation also we will record this session and the recording of the session will then be made available for East members on the East website so without further ado Emilia thanks for being with us and Please share your slide. The floor is with you. Thank now, you for that lovely introduction. I will just share them now. Share screen. And hopefully you can see that now. Perfect. Hello, everybody. As Inna said, I'm Amelia Harding, and I work for a medical journal called BMJ here in London. Um, so for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give a quick run through on um, inclusive language, and then we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for um, questions. So do feel free to put any questions in the Q&A. And if you have any extra resources and um, things that you think are relevant, please do add them into the chat as well um, to help everybody else. Uh, just first and foremost, I don't always coordinate my outfit with my presentation slides. That is just a happy coincidence today. Um, so I am a technical editor for Style. So at BMJ, um, we've increasingly had over the last couple of years um, more issues and queries relating to inclusive language. Um, so the, uh, the company decided to add more time and resources into developing an internal policy um, and strategy and having a dedicated person um, to develop our inclusive language development in internally. Um, and that is where I come in and that is my um, role. I also, um, my first and foremost, my job is a technical editor. So that means basically after uh, articles are accepted, they come to me for content editing, um, particularly research articles. So just a quick disclaimer about me. Obviously, I am just one person um, and these are my experiences and, and research. Um, and I speak English as my native language and I'll be referring to English throughout this. Um, my career, as I said, is mainly focused on medical journals. So I've been at the BMJ now for a year. Um, previous to that, I was at The Lancet for seven years, where we also had um, an inclusive language working group there for um, to create internal working guidelines. So what is inclusive language? Um, this definition here in the middle is quite wordy. Uh, basically, it's saying be nice to each other, <laughs> think about other people. Um, uh, so lots of adjectives here. So avoid harming or offending in your language. Be respectful, accurate and relevant. So that means don't add extra information if it's not needed. For example, don't say this woman did this if it's not relevant that she's a woman. Um, and do not perpetuate prejudice, stigma or erasure. So around here, this box here, I've got lots of different sort of examples of um, areas and subjects that we find at the BMJ to be sort of tricky and sometimes a bit divisive or challenging to navigate. Um, an example here that's sort of not very uh, controversial is age. So when you're thinking of age in the media, uh, in lots of different places, uh, young people are seen as sort of youthful and healthy, active, uh, and older people perhaps have more diseases or might be frail. And of course, this is the case in some situations, but it's not the case for every person. Um, and the whole point of inclusive language is to get away from those sort of stereotypes and those assumptions. 
um, if we assume that all young people are healthy uh, physically, mentally, then you miss opportunities um, to address problems that are actually there in society. And again, if you're always referring to older people as frail, um, those sort of derogatory statements um, create barriers for um, older people to engage um, in society if you're already dismissing them as, oh, you know, they can't run a marathon, but older people can run marathons, et cetera. So I'll give more examples and get into a little bit more depth as we go on, but this is sort of a general idea. Um, and these sort of subject areas are taken from um, a guidance I'll refer to later, um, C4 DISC guidance that I love. Um, and they give great examples of how to um, navigate each of these subject areas, what to avoid, what to use, um, and they also have some great references to back up why you're doing that. Um, so some sort of nitty gritty examples. So here on the left hand side, um, you might see sort of these phrases quite often and perhaps think they're harmless. Um, but when you sit down and think about them, um, they actually do have some negative connotations that we would like to avoid when thinking in inclusive language. So preferred terminology. White, non-white, race and ethnicity is quite a big topic um, when we're talking about inclusive language um, in humans. And often in research historically and unfortunately still to this day, um, white race and ethnicity is seen as a point of reference. I see it all the time in, in papers I edit that say 96% um, of people were white and then 4% of people were non-white. Um, and it's so important that we break down the non-white and we don't use white as a reference point. Um, we will obviously, there's lots of different reasons for this and I won't go into why diversity and inclusion is important in science, that will be a tangent. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate how important it is to be specific. Um, and looking at these other examples here, so confined to a wheelchair, it's quite a negative uh, connotation um, and it's not very empowering. So uses a wheelchair. Western world, um, often people just mean North American Europe. So be specific and say that. Again, if you're in, in Western America, to the west of you is not Europe, it's um, China. So that's perhaps ambiguous as well. And it can get confusing. The poor, um, again, often people have good intentions, um, but you shouldn't be identifying groups as just the poor. Um, people are people first and foremost, and they're, what they're experiencing um, is not their identity, which is why we'd say people experiencing poverty. Um, they are other, other things apart from whatever their income level is. Mums and dads. Um, this one covers both uh, inclusivity in terms of um, people who are children who are raised by sort of foster uh, guardians or um, raised by their auntie or uncle or family friend. But it also is inclusive of people who don't identify as a, a woman or a man um, and wouldn't want to be referred to as mums and dads. Mankind, humankind, um, gender neutrality is quite a hot topic um, and something that you can easily implement um, especially talking in English. I know obviously different languages have different um, situations uh, when they're gendered like French or Spanish. Um, but in English, you can change mankind to humankind um, and not make that point of reference just sort of a masculine um, language. Uh, these last three are sort of medical terms that I see all the time about um, authors refer to patients as failing treatment. Um, and again, it's not the patient's fault that they are failing treatment and it sort of puts the blame onto them. And they don't have any sort of say in the matter, but even if they did, it's quite sort of a derogatory statement. So let's change that around and say the treatment was not successful. Um, an addict, um, again, same as the poor, you're identifying that person as just their behavior or just um, their income level. So they are a person first and foremost and avoid sort of suffering, um, just say pe person with epilepsy. You wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm Amelia and I suffer from asthma. I just have asthma and sometimes I have worse symptoms than others. Um, right, 
So why do we care? If I haven't already got you sort of motivated about why we care, there are lots of different human reasons why we care um, and lots of different scientific reasons as well, as we know. Um, I won't go into this because I'm short on time, but um, if I haven't already convinced you with the human reasons, there is also the business reason for your journals or your organization um, in that if you aren't using inclusive language, you are opening yourself up to risk. Um, so people can complain, it can affect your sort of reputation and your credibility. So it's really important that we are having these conversations and starting to think about them um, using inclusive language as our house styles in our journals um, and sort of protecting ourselves in terms of having um, a, somewhere, some sort of proof to back ourselves up. Why are we doing this? Why are we changing this? Um, which is why I really like using the guidelines and which is why BMJ are making our own guidelines. So everyone internally is consistent. We will sort of agree on what we're going to change and what we're not going to change and makes us our lives much easier when we're negotiating with authors. Um, and also just one last thing on this slide, um, language affects behavior. So if we are putting out inclusive language, we are encouraging inclusive behaviors in the world. And that can only be a good thing as far as I'm concerned. So the challenges, um, I could have written a whole slide more on this. I could have gone on ages on this. Um, and if you've ever had to sort of navigate inclusive language, I'm sure you are fully aware that there are lots and lots of sort of gray areas. It's never black and white. Um, although if you do have some sort of internal guidelines, that's helpful to um, give you sort of more um, confidence on using the right terms. Um, but as I said in the top here, language is complex and rapidly evolving. I mean, I've been sort of looking into inclusive language for years now, and every week I'm learning something new and we have to update our guidelines. Um, you just have to keep interested and keep reading. Um, and listening to people who are, have lived experience. Um, uh, so technical terms and science need global consensus. Um, I'll explain this later in one of the examples, um, but there's a lot sort of history behind why we use certain terms in science. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to change and update historical terms um, and technical terms. And that's why collaboration like these sorts of webinars are really important um, to network with people. Um, so we're all on the same path and have the same sort of ideas about what we want to change. Um, confidence uh, can limit us and understanding. This is definitely something when I first started looking into inclusive language, um, I felt very sort of awkward about saying the wrong thing. Um, I felt like I didn't know enough. I still feel like I don't know enough. I could read sort of every article and perhaps still feel like you don't know enough because um, you are sometimes speaking on behalf of other people. Um, and that's why it's so important to uh, get the people that you're talking about involved in those conversations, something that BMJ is very good at doing. Um, we're very patient, patient focused. So we ask patients to come in and, and say, are you happy with being referred to in this way? Or is this sort of phrasing okay with you? How does it make you feel? And um, what would you prefer to be referred to as? Um, so balance between flexibility and internal consistency. This is one of our big challenges in that we want to keep the author's voice. Um, obviously, we're working with lots of intelligent academics who are experts in their fields. They know what they're talking about. Um, but we need to be uh, consistent internally for our own sort of brand, as I said before, about protecting ourselves um, against sort of complaints, but also um, uh, so we have, yeah, the same sort of voice. Um, and again, when you're negotiating with authors, sometimes it involves perhaps more compromise on some articles than other articles, um, and that can be quite difficult. So again, nice to have a, a document that you can refer to if possible. Uh, so I will um, skip through all these sorts of things. I've already sort of spoken about them. Again, I work for medical companies that have quite a lot of resources and time and energy. And I know lots of people don't have those wonderful resources, um, but there are places to use, um, places to seek extra guidance. 
that have already had those sort of resources put into them. Um, and I'll get to those later. Um, so I've already sort of touched on what we do at BMJ. So uh, as the technical editor for Style, um, I chair the Style Guide Council. Um, basically, we have a group of interested people. And when situations arise with difficult language, we go back together, get together and say, what do you think? What should we do? Has anyone had this problem before? Um, and then we make changes to our style guide if needed. Uh, lots of sort of um, complaints come to us from research integrity team, not, not just complaints, but sort of comments as well. Um, and that also affects how we update ourselves. Um, the inclusive language working group here, um, although we are sort of a larger journal, we're still at the beginning stages of our um, inclusive language uh, process. Where I'd like us to be is much, much further ahead, um, but we're working towards it. So we set up a group, there's about 20 of us. It's quite a lot, actually. It's perhaps too many um, because you can't get anything done because everyone has ideas. Um, so we're going to be splitting off into smaller groups to do some research. But um, we have our own group uh, that are looking to align BMJ style with other documents that are out there. Um, and that will be internally to start off with, as it is for the Lancet, that was internally. But BMJ, we want to go one step further and eventually publish this online so everyone else can use it. Um, but we need to get sort of almost like peer review done first um, from these sort of um, employee resource groups and also from uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, charities, et cetera. Uh, so um, any decisions that we do make as a company, um, we try and, and communicate them. I, again, I think we could probably be doing more at BMJ, um, but we do have Cameron, our editor-in-chief. Um, he's recently, there's a, I've got an issue here from BMJ, oh, it was a blurry anyway. Um, this week's issue is on transgender medicine and um, Cameron's done a great sort of editorial there uh, discussing sort of what we think as a company. Um, and that's nice to be able to refer to when we're talking to authors as well. I already mentioned about BMJ's um, involvement with patients. Uh, what can you do? As I've said before, um, educate yourselves, agree on some sort of policy or guidelines using reputable sources, um, gender neutral uh, language. Um, the main important thing is uh, listen and learn. And if you do make mistakes, acknowledge the mistakes um, and correct them. And then also be back to your colleagues and say, look, this happened. Um, we've done this. Let's not do it again. I'm just telling you so you don't make the same mistake. Um, and encourage and be kind to yourself because you will make mistakes. I've made mistakes all the time. It's part of the whole process of EDI. Uh, right, so ongoing discussions. Um, at BMJ. So uh, this, how do we handle mistakes? I sort of mentioned this before um, about uh, apologizing, updating our style guide. This bottom one here, should we make historical changes? It's sort of um, a debatable topic at the moment. I mean, nobody has resources to go back and every article published and, and decide whether things are, um, are inclusive, lang inclusive or not. And I don't think we should be doing that either because version control is good. So we can see how far we've come. We don't want to rewrite history. Um, but here we had a situation where um, we had a French study group and in the name um, they had in the actual working group name, they had mental retardation and handicap, which are two phrases that we wouldn't prefer to use nowadays, it's quite old fashioned, outdated language. Um, but the group were really uh, dead set on keeping that because obviously all of their previous papers had this phrasing, this working group. And so for their own internal consistency, they wanted to link their records with the previous ones that they published. Um, but we didn't feel like it was appropriate to keep that wording now in modern day times. So um, we ended up compromising. So we kept their working group, but then we had a disclaimer and we said, this language is outdated. We will use intellectual disability and physical disability throughout the paper um, and yeah that seemed to be a good solution um, in terms of historical content. Um, you've probably heard of when the Lancet stuck 
bodies with vaginas on um, their covers. Um, there was an academic protest outside our offices, um, which was which was quite fun because you don't really get academic protests much. Um, and uh, the editor in chief had to end up apologising because um, lots of women deemed bodies of vaginas was erasing their identity as women. Um, and genders also, it's a very sort of divisive, but it's very, it sparks a lot of debate. Um, you just have to look at J.K. Rowling. Um, that's a very English reference, but I hope you will get it from Harry Potter. Um, yeah. And uh, is technical language exempt? Especially sort of the area that I work in, in research, we have you know, lots of trial language, double blind randomized trial. Um, the use of sort of blinding trials is very sort of common, widely accepted language. Um, it's very sort of succinct as well. Everyone knows what it means, but it is quite ableist. Um, it assumes everyone is seeing. And there's debate at the moment whether we want to change double blind. Um, and at the moment, as BMJ are referring to other groups like um, the International Journal Committee of Medical Editors, ICMJE, and COPE, which is the Council of Publication Ethics as well. So um, we're seeking sort of external output to see what other journals are doing. Um, so resources, uh, I will... Um, pass this on to Mary and Innes and they will um, send you the link so you can access these. So the top two um, are actual practical guidelines that you can do, use day to day and they're not just for medicine, they're for just scholarly communication and just inclusive language overall. Um, so hopefully they'll be really useful resources. Um, the European Parliament um, glossary on sensitive language as well. Um, Innes has showed me, thank you very much for that. It's also in lots of different European languages as well. So you can pass them on to your colleagues who don't speak um, English or don't have English as the native language. Um, yeah, lots to dig in here, but um, templates for authors, as I was saying earlier, it's quite difficult to neg negotiate with authors. Um, here is a link to um, Scholarly Kitchen, and they're really good at um, literally just a template that you could plug in what your issue is, what you want to change it to, and the reasons behind why. Um, and hopefully that will be able to open that dialogue with authors um, in a sort of friendly uh, way. And um, any other interesting things on here? Um, so as I was saying, read, you can read around the topic in lots of different places. Scholarly Kitchen is great. Um, if you're unsure about your own unbiased, uh, um unconscious bias sorry you can take the harvard implicit bias tests they're really interesting i would definitely recommend that and they're all free um and thinking on to the future i think uh inclusive language is going to be improved and make our lives a lot easier when we use technology like this alex js personally i've not used it um not yet but it is free code so for the technically minded i would definitely recommend going onto that website. And basically, once you've downloaded it, it goes through your text and whatever you're writing, and it flags up words that are um, insensitive or not inclusive in red. So you see right away, don't use that word. And then they have also, it flags up other words in, in amber um, that maybe you should consider, is it the right context to be using those words? So feel free to dig into those resource for a bit wider. Um, reading. So overall, sorry, this has been quite a, a whiz through um, and I could talk about this for hours. So I hope I've got wet your appetite so you can go in and further read up. But take home messages. There is no right answer. Um, collab collaboration is key. Um, listen to other people, learn from other people. Um, if you're doing medical research or human or working with humans, you know, uh, listen to the people you're actually writing about um, or publishing about. And um, language will continue to evolve. It is always evolving, especially at the moment. Um, but as always, if you always put the human, always put the individual first and humanize the individual, uh, you'll be all right. Um, and that is it from me. So I will open up two questions. I think I've heard some dinging um, from the questions. 
I will perhaps. Thank you very much, Amelia. That was really, really interesting. And I think it has also shown us that there's much to do for us editors, both on the learning side, but also uh, in having an opportunity so we can help others to get better and we can be a bit on the lead and we can pay, lead the way into being more thoughtful about how we use language, in particular when it is about others and when it leads to bias and exclusion, not inclusion. So I don't know if there are questions in the chat. Otherwise, I would, oh, there's a question for you um, in the chat. I think Mary has put it uh, for someone. I don't know who's asked the question. It says, is there a set of guidelines that set out race and ethnicity wording to be used to describe different groups? This is a great question. Um... And there's lots and lots of different information out there um, if you look into it. I would start, as I said, with the, um, the C4 DISC um, document. It's really great. It has, like I said at the beginning about a table with sort of uh, avoid this terminology and use this terminology. Um, and it, it, yeah, it gives you a good guidance. You might also have to think about things internally, how you want to format, um, for, for example, um, race and ethnicity, whether you want to capitalize sort of white, black, um, and different parts of the world do things sort of differently. I know America particularly um, like to have white lower lowercase and black capitalized. Um, at the BMJ, we sort of lowercase everything. Um, so it might depend as well on where in the world your authors are from. Thank you. I can, oh, yeah, oh, there's more questions. Can you see the chat, by the way, Amelia? I can. Uh, yep. I, I think there are quite a few uh, questions. Are the C1 disc good to refer to um, in your instructions for authors? Um, yeah, I think, why not? I think it's a great place um, to refer. So authors can actually use it whilst they're um, writing before they've even uh, sent this uh, sent anything on to you um and also it's good for you to have sort of a, a a transparent policy to say we are using this document um and if anything comes up you can refer back to c4 disc and say we've had this feedback have you considered it um so i think yeah definitely it'd be good to add to instructions for authors we don't have the bmj but hopefully our instructions for authors are um being amended as we speak so hopefully we'll do something um, with that further down the line yeah. Um, okay. So have you found a strategy for words that are not gender neutral, such as alumni, alumnus, alumna, or Latino, Latina? Really good questions. Um, no, <laughs> the answer is no, we haven't. Um, we, at the moment, are referring sort of to the authors what they would prefer to use. Um, it, it does get difficult when the language is gendered itself, Latino, Latina, Latin X. Um, and um, I guess it depends on the context. Um, if it's, for example, uh, something written from a viewpoint of the author, we would just sort of go with what the author says. If the author wants to use Latin X, and that's absolutely fine. Um, and yeah, it's always good to think about these sorts of things. I think um, as long as you're being intentional and thoughtful and not sort of just referring to sort of like a masculine um, way of writing, then I think um, you're sort of halfway there. Um, yeah. So no, not yet, 100%. <laughs> Emilia, do you want to stop sharing so we could even Ooh, yes. uh, later ask, we may take the questions in the chat and then we could later also ask people to, to ask the questions if they wanted to themselves. But I think... We still have quite a few questions in the chat. Um, so okay. there is, let me see. Um, here. I edit, uh, how it says, I edit a journal that publishes a lot of work done in nature, so-called field work. And it has been proposed that field work may, uh, sorry, cannot be used because it's uh, re related to slavery. Is the question, what is your take on that? Um. Another example, we have an article type called Stories from the Front. Do you have any recommendations? Frontlines. Front lines, sorry. Written by Wait. practitioners about the challenges that they face and how they deal with them. It has been proposed that we should not 
change that we should sorry change this because front lines is an allusion to war and i fully agree we try to avoid warfare language as much as we can in our journey do you have any recommendations about how to handle what will invariably be a large number of such suggestions um yeah i think these are great specific um terminology for your area that will perhaps come up regularly so it's good to have a specific sort of policy on it um i think if you can change field work and stories from the front lines to something that's sort of succinct then definitely do um this is a sort of uh wide uh reaching um change that might be good as well if you do decide have a policy on it to communicate it with your author saying right we've had a look into our inclusive language these sorts of things have come up and we've decided that we're we're going to try and be more inclusive and this is the way that we're going to rephrase them so that it won't repeat time and time again um I see another question from Jeremy. Jeremy, do you want to take the floor? And and uh, so I don't have to, we don't have to read out the questions. Do you want to ask your question yourself? Is that okay? There you are. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah. No, no, it's just, um, hi, uh, Jeremy here from um, ECDC. We're, we're looking at this as well. And one of the things that has come up is is who to ask. You know, so mm -hmm. you mentioned like, Obviously, we don't have all of the experiences of all of these things, so we need to get experts and people who are closer to the actual issues. So, for example, uh, with uh, issues around drugs, um, you know, ask people who are in NGOs. But I just wondered if you had any other avenues that you explore, like who who are you asking? Um, yeah, great question. So, for our internal guidelines, we are um, asking. The style council first and foremost and then once we've got that we go to our employee resource group so they are people like women at bmj and um, cultural inclusion at bmj um uh, we have a carers cafe that includes carers and, and parents and then from that point we also have sort of experts that are um our editors are in touch with sort of like our network and our editorial board they're great members to get in contact with because they'll know um people sort of who are on, on the, I was going to say on the front lines, but no, um, who are at the forefront actually um, doing the academic research. So uh, advocacy, advocacy groups as well. Um, yep, you're talking about NGOs. Um, and also sort of you could contact um, places like uh, C4DISC um, as well, because they will, they've done the research and they've looked into these sorts of um, uh, issues so they will have already sort of made contacts there and they might be able to put you in touch if you've got specific questions um yeah i hope that answered it does thank you i have a question for you for more for the group out there i mean it's sometimes very obvious and evident of where the problem lies when we talk about biomedical research social science and it may not be as evident when you are in a te more technical field do we have any editors? I don't know in this group uh, here. Do we have anyone who's in a more technical field? And do you experience a bit of a similar challenge when you when you edit and when you look at your articles? And how would you deal with that? Or is there is the awareness in, in your field less advanced maybe than it is in other fields that I just mentioned? Is there anyone who would like to step forward? Please We've got take the mic. Hand up from Ari. Ari is also biomedical, but Ari, please take the floor. Well, thank you. Uh, I was raising my hand to ask a question, really, not because I'm not on the technical side. Uh, could you hear me all right? Great. Uh, well, thank you, Amelia, for a great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering one thing, talking about inclusive language, because biologically speaking, I think there's general agreement that there is no such thing as human races. Uh, but still, most English-speaking academic journals use the term race, which I think is very problematic and I'm not up to uh, academic standards. 
I think in most Nordic languages, uh, that term is abandoned years ago. Uh, we don't use it anymore at our journal, and don't think the other Nordic journals do as well. Has the BMJ taken any stand on that or discussed it at all? Really interesting question. Um, and you're absolutely right. Race is one of those sort of um, man made terms, isn't it? Um, we haven't got a we haven't got a strict rule against excluding it because we are sort of our hands are tied by um the government and you know all of the sort of the questionnaires and the databases that we do use do still refer to race and it be inaccurate if we suddenly changed it to ethnicity um if that's what people have identified themselves as um but it is interesting whether we could change that for more sort of uh, opinion pieces that are less sort of entrenched in research and based on um previous uh categories and definitions something mm. to think about yeah thank you unless we have another question can i have can i have a question for you my of question course. would be to uh, i think ethnicity is a very complex subject and for us we sometimes struggle because uh, we were discussed discussing very recently if being Danish or, or if Danes, if that's an ethnic, so uh, versus a non-Dane, as this is definitely not mm -hmm. a good way of putting it because it's an exclusive language, not an inclusive language, as you showed us. So what is your take on ethnicity? How would you, what is the suggestion for a construct that would be inclusive when you talk about ethnicity? Um. Ethnicity, I guess, has to be sort of self-identified. Um, I wouldn't want to impose on anyone, say, you can't identify as this ethnicity or this ethnicity. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't have any <laughs> further insight into that, unfortunately. Um, but it is a really interesting question and something to think about in an ongoing discussion. Are there any further questions from the group? Please raise your hands, take the mic. I think we have Yeah, to... hi, it's Howard again. I just come back to my, my question about, um, you know, how, how to, uh, where to draw the line, I guess, on, on whether something should be changed. So I am the editor of a marine science journal, no human subjects involved. Mm -hmm. So something like field work, you know, I mean, that's been used forever. It's like you go out into nature on a ship or, you know, and nobody in our readership, well, I shouldn't say that, but I would say that the first thing people would think of would not be slavery. <laughs> you know, I mean, if if I did a poll, mm. now I'm not saying nobody would, of course, somebody might. But is that a sufficient reason to to change uh, a terminology that's been established since the beginning of the field? Where do you draw the line on this? I mean, how do you decide without just knee jerking and changing everything when somebody asks? Yeah, it's yeah, it's such a difficult, complicated um, topic. And like I was saying before about. Um, in my field, double blind randomized trials. Um, some people have really wanted to change it. I think maybe some journals have changed it, but we've been reluctant to change it because it wouldn't make sense if people didn't understand what we changed it to, if it made our articles hard to find or hard to understand. Um, and I guess this is where it comes in, collaboration comes in. If everybody in your field has decided that, yes, let's change it, um, or well, you always need some sort of pioneers, but um, uh, yeah, I guess if you if one person changed it and nobody else changed it, would that make it more complicated because people wouldn't be able to understand? Um, it's an in interesting, nuanced question. I don't have a, a straightforward answer for you, um, but I would recommend um, speaking to people in your specialism and seeing what they think, um, seeing if you can get other ideas from people who vary their opinion to you and think that it should be changed and see if they can um, tell you why. 
Well, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to hog all the time here, but I did do that with our editorial board, which is 75 people. And as you can imagine, the uh, re replies were all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. And then I guess it, it comes down to you to make a sort of editorial decision whether you're going to change that or not. Um, and perhaps well, yeah, you don't but for now. That's what I mean. I, I anticipate there are going to be a large number of these. And we will be using a lot of time. And then, we're, and I think what we need, I'm not saying we're going to come to this today here in this discussion, is some kind of guidelines about like, okay, well, when when is it really not, you know, absolutely clear you have to change? Mm. And, and when is it maybe up to you? Mm. Yeah. That's that's sounds it. like an interesting, you could have that, you could open that up to your authors and have that discussion in your journal. Mm. Um, I think we have some more hands up. I don't know how much time. I don't want to hog all the time because I know that we need to get talking about ease as well. Ennis, you're on mute, I think. I think we can accept one or two more questions. So, okay. uh, Trevor? I don't see hands up, but you may see them. And okay. I think there were some questions in the chat as well. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, hi, uh, Trevor. I'm in Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, my question, I guess, is I'm thinking about um, that French study group and, you know, authors insisting on using language that is perhaps not inclusive for one reason or another, whether that's, um, you know, an international authorship, thinking about their audiences or what have you. But I guess from your perspective as an editor, do you find yourself in those situations adding editorial notes to sort of contextualize the author's usages of those terms. If you're thinking about, you know, if the BMJ is a brand or has a brand as an editorial force, like, is that something you keep in mind or um, do you sort of just let the article speak for itself? Um, yeah, I think it depends on sort of the article type. Like I said, if it was from, if it was like an opinion piece from a person, it was obvious that that was their opinion, then perhaps we wouldn't add some sort of editorial disclaimer um, but this situation that I spoke about was a research paper um, so we felt it quite important to add those disclaimers and we still do add disclaimers for if we're trying to be inclusive in terms of sort of perhaps like pregnant women or um, talking about um, we would say pregnant women and people who are pregnant um, however we will refer to no sorry we would say um when we refer to pregnant women in this paper, we are also referring to all pregnant people. Um, but for brevity, we will refer to everybody as pregnant women. And then we'll speak the whole paper will be about pregnant women rather than each time having to be like pregnant women and pregnant people. Um, so that's something, yeah, we definitely do on the regular. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. There's one more. There, there were a few comments, but I see one more question, which we skipped over probably earlier. Are you able to... Sorry, the question was if you're able to, for example, in a school class, if there's a other child, if you would, or a black child, would you be able to, or a child that is different from the others, would you be able to point towards them? Uh, would it be okay to identify the child as Asian, black, or whatever, if this is obvious? Um, again, in the context, I hope you know the children's name, so I would just use the child's name. But um, I do see where you're uh, getting uh, sort of where your point is um, generally. Um, I think perhaps not. Um, I don't think because you're sort of othering that person. Would you refer to the other person as look at the white person? Probably not. Um, I would avoid it. Are uh, just a technical thing. At what point, at what stage in the editorial process do you uh, do you address the problem of exclusive language? Is that at the end or at the beginning? Um, it's throughout the whole thing. We were thinking about it all thing. the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so before we even accept <clears throat> a paper, um, we will send our papers to uh, patient advocates. Um, we also have employed patient a, a, a couple of employed patient editors on our salary um, mm. so we send it to them before it's even sort of come through to me and then when it comes through to me again I put my inclusive language hat on and then have a look at it mm -hmm. again 
Okay. Yeah, we have started to have a short sentence in our letters when when we um, ask authors to invite authors to revise and also the review. We have some instructions online and we also try to to ask reviewers to, to look into this in the future. Yeah, exactly. The information for authors is a great place to start uh, just mm. to get people thinking about it before they've even sort of submitted their papers. Okay, I think we have taken enough of your time. You've given us quite a bit of uh, food for thought. Thank you so much. And uh, we will have your this recording with all the resources. We will have it on the EASE website in the members area. But we will also share a slide. Mary will share a slide with everyone who was on this meeting with the resources. And so thank you very much. Uh, this is much appreciated. And it's probably not the last time we'll talk about this soft <laughs> subject. And as you have shown us, it's something that's a living uh, it's a living review kind of thing. You have to always think of where you stand and if it's still correct what you did yesterday. Thanks a lot. Definitely. Thank you very much for listening and thanks for your great questions. It's always good to, to keep thinking. <laughs> it challenges me too. Um, okay, I will leave you to it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.